Uh, my name's Stephen Briars. I am Group Editor of Automotive Management, and I'm your host for this session on New Cars Are Expensive, Just Deal With It. So sponsoring this session is CrimTam, and I'm delighted that speaking on this session, we have Fraser Brown, Managing Director of Motorvise, who I'm told will be talking the talk. And walking the walk will be Adam Derbyshire, Managing Director at Spirit Hyundai. So inflation and interest rates have made new cars more uh, or look less affordable. So what can dealers do about it? In this session, we'll be looking at deal building. We'll look, be looking at sales closing and maybe a change in the sales process. And um, that'll all come into the microscope as we go through the next 45 minutes. We'll have a presentation from Fraser, uh, a discussion between Fraser and Adam, and you will have the opportunity to ask some of your own questions towards the end. So please get thinking about them. Put your hand up, a microphone will come to you, and we'll, uh, we'll close out that way. So without further ado, I will invite Fraser Brank to the lectern to deliver your presentation. Good morning, everybody. Can you all hear me? Right, okay. Great to see so many friendly faces that I recognize. Thank you for kind of coming along, giving us the time of day. Um, yes, I'm going to kind of talk through some thought provokers, some different ideas, some things that you may have seen before, some things that you may not have done. And then we're going to have a discussion with Adam, because Adam obviously runs a car dealership, a multiple site business, um, and is hands on every day. And uh, I don't have that pressure. Uh, what is it they say? Those that can't teach and those that can actually get on and do it. So, uh, okay, let's see if we can get the technology working. So, we were landed with a synopsis. And so, what I'm going to do to start with is talk you through my thought process around kind of where we went to with this synopsis and, and where we ended up at. Um, and then it'd be really good to get some engagement and discussion around it at the end of it. So, the synopsis was that inflation and interest rates have made cars less affordable. And I regularly hear people, friends and family saying to me, you know, cars have got very expensive. And, and actually what we're seeing is fewer people buying new cars. So what can we do about it? Ultimately, in a car dealership, we don't get to influence the price of new cars very much. Um, it's the manufacturers. They give us that, um, that. That's what we have to play with. They're part of the rules that the, the manufacturers set for us that we as dealers have to engage with. What we can do, there are things that we can do to present these new higher priced cars in a better way that helps it be more palatable for the consumer. And how we do that, it it's actually has the potential to be become a new... Uh, mis-selling scandal if we don't handle it really well. Um, and we're going to talk about why and how and, and get into some conversation a little bit later on. So, in qu question, are cars more expensive? So you can see I've watered down the question very slightly, not new cars. Um, and, and then I kind of came up with all of these different things that were contributing towards cars being less affordable for consumers. Um, so we're looking at the price of new cars and the price of used cars. We looked at PCP and HP interest rates and the residual values. And one of the biggest areas that I think is going to see massive change with the different drive trains over the coming 18 months is residual values. I think we're going to see residual values for certain drive trains going up significantly and for other drive trains going down significantly. And that will then impact everything that we're going to talk about a little bit later on. We then have battery electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, PHEVs, and ICE vehicles. We then have the price of petrol, the price of diesel, the price of electricity. We then have the huge disparity between public charging rates, so how much it costs you, let's say up to 75 pence per kilowatt to charge a car at a BP Pulse, for example. And then as little as 6.3 pence on Octopus Intelligent rates to charge a car up at home overnight. So we've got big disparities there. So what I'm trying to say here is this is not a simple subject. Um, and we want to talk about all these areas to get to a point where we consolidate a view on this. So the question is, is, more ex is motoring more expensive? We've watered the question down just a little bit more. Um, because for me, it's all about having the ability to use a car that is mine when I want it, okay? I don't necessarily need to own it, um, but I need to have a car that's there that I can use when I want it. And there's a cost attached to that. The next thing is, um, cost for having it there, it, it, you know, that's a privilege that, uh, that, that we can have. 
Um, and then there's a cost for driving it per mile, okay? So whether that is 20, 22 pence per mile for certain vehicles, or whether it's around two pence per mile for other vehicles, depending on how you fuel those vehicles. So let's unpick some of this mess that we talked about previously. Okay, this is where we need a bit of audience participation. Um, the first one's dead simple, a little bit patronizing, but I want to have a, a literally, all you have to shout is higher or lower. And then when we get to the end of this, you'll see how complicated the whole picture is. And then what we've got to do is look at how we're going to unpick that for the consumer and get it into a way that is presentable for them to help them understand whether a car is expensive or it isn't. Oh, good out. So a really simple one for you. Um, is a new car a higher or a lower price than a used car? Higher. Thank you. Excellent. OK. I need to get a bit louder. This is like, you know, do you not remember Bruce Forsyth's Play Your Cards Right? OK. Um, next one is, is a PHEV a higher or a lower price than a petrol car? So, higher. Absolutely. Excellent. So, so the next one, is, petrol, is a petrol car a higher or a lower price than an electric car? Absolutely. OK. And then on to fuel. So is petrol more expensive or less expensive? Is it higher price or a lower price than electric? Higher, absolutely. OK. Try and get the clicker to work. Yeah, absolutely. So it's higher. So the final one. So is public charging a higher or a lower price than domestic overnight charging? OK, thank you. Right. So. So back to the mess. We keep coming back to all this mess, OK? So we've got the new car prices, the used car prices, PCP, HP interest rates, residual values. And all of these things are contributing to the cost of ownership for a car. So let's put it all into some order. And you may not have seen this kind of way of looking at it before, probably because I made it up a few days ago. But <laughs> what we've got here, we kind of tried to land everything into something that's a little bit more simple to understand. On the left-hand side, we've got the, the cost of the new vehicle. So we can see a nice vehicle or a petrol vehicle is generally a much lower cost than a mild hybrid, full hybrid, plug-in hybrid, and then ultimately an electric vehicle. So what we have is the cost of the car on the left, at the bottom being low, so a petrol car, and an electric vehicle on the top left is an expensive car. But on the flip side over here, it's far more expensive to run a car on petrol. Then what we have is electric public charging. So public charging for electric cars. Do you know what? It isn't that much cheaper to run a car from a BP pull station on electric than it is on petrol in terms of cost per mile because it's obscenely priced. Then what we have is daytime electric. So if you've got solar panels on the roof of your house or you've got access to domestic electricity during the day, that's probably about half the price of filling it up at a public charger. Then what we have is we have the magic. We have the domestic overnight charging. Now, we're talking about this is a show for the whole of the United Kingdom. If you're in Northern Ireland, these figures are not the same. In Northern Ireland, you'll pay about 13.6 pence because they don't have smart meters over there. So you can't access really cheap domestic overnight charging. Whereas in the UK, the rest of England, Britain, so Britain, we actually have um, really low cost overnight charging at 6.3 pence. That brings a cost per mile for fuel for many electric cars, because just like petrol cars, some electric cars are good on fuel and some are not, just like we have with petrol cars. But you can get cars that are about 1.6 pence per mile to run on electric, whereas petrol cars are generally 10 times that amount, very roughly. Um, and then ultimately, if you've got free workplace charging or supermarkets, or I have a friend who I sold an electric car to who has free charging at the golf club. He's never played so much golf. Um, but yeah, there's all kinds of ways that you can access um, lower cost charging. So let's combine all of that. So, what we saw on that previous slide was just new cars. If we then throw used cars into the mix as well, what you end up with is an even more complicated picture. So how on earth are we supposed to com communicate all of this with consumers to help them understand how they can access motoring that is low cost for the car, 
and low cost per mile. Because that's the holy grail. Because if we can get to that point, you could almost drive a car for no monthly payment. And I'm going to actually demonstrate that with a real deal that I did with a real person only three weeks ago. So, educating customers and making sure we advise customers correctly is quite complicated for us, never mind for consumers. So how do we advise consumers about these choices? Because um, we don't want another mis-selling scandal. You can imagine sitting in a showroom and telling customers you can drive a car for about two pence per mile without establishing whether they've got access to domestic overnight charging, without knowing whether they can fit a smart meter. They drive the car away, they go to get their meter fitted, and they go to get their, uh, public, their home charger installed and find that it can't be done because they can't get a smart meter signal. Okay, So you end up with people being missold to because we're not giving them the information that they need to make a fully informed decision about how they bring down the cost of their motoring. So it's really important we have, we don't want to create another mis-selling scandal. We've already had the range issues with EVs, the potential for further mis-selling by misadvising people on costs per mile is huge. So we need to consider how we build a conversation with every single consumer. So this is what I call our conversation pyramid. In our industry, virtually everybody in this room will be talking about ZEV. What on earth is ZEV to a consumer? What do they know about that? And the answer is very, very little. Most consumers, 80% of consumers, have no knowledge of it. So it's essential that every single customer that comes into a car dealership is told about the ZEV mandate. Now, they may be able to drive a petrol car today. They may be able to buy a petrol car today. But the chances are we're only five years away from 80% of vehicles being zero emission vehicles, registered, new, new registrations. So what does that mean? It means you might be able to get a hybrid or you might be able to get a petrol car today. The next time you come to change your car, Mr. Customer, you're almost certainly not going to be able to do that. You won't have that choice the chances are you will have to buy a zero emission vehicle because the manufacturers will restrict supply so heavily that only one in five cars within one change cycle, three years, will, be, will actually be available as a petrol car. And mark my words, they'll be the most expensive cars on the planet because manufacturers know how to maximize their margins, okay? So it's unlikely that they'll be using um, the petrol allocation that they have available to supply cheap petrol cars. They'll be taking those as the fat margin cars at the top end of the scale. So for the most consumers, they're not going to be able to realistically afford a new petrol car when they come to change their car next time. So don't let it be a shock for them. It's essential that we're telling them about that today. So the first conversation we should be having with every single consumer in our showrooms today is what is the ZEV mandate and what does it mean for them? Second, we need to talk to them about the types of vehicles. Remember the slide with the high and low on it? Um, we need to explain. We can sell you a cheaper car today that will cost you more to run. It's called a petrol car or an ICE car. Or we can sell you a more expensive car, an electric car, that's much, much cheaper to run. And we need to be having that conversation with every customer. And then we also need to make sure we establish what range they're doing. Because we need to know that what's, what's the maximum you drive in any one week? What's the maximum number of miles in a day? So let's talk about a 14-day period. Invariably, I go and visit my mother once a week. That's my longest journey, OK? Um, so what is the longest journey that they do on a regular basis? So that you can sell them a car that will be full every morning with what they need. So it's got the right range in the first place. So we qualify the cost to charge for the customer. We then need to establish, can they access domestic overnight charging? Because if we're going to demonstrate fuel savings to them later on in the sales process when we're trying to close the deal, then we need to be sure that they can access those savings with domestic overnight charging. So where do you park your car? Is it near your drive? Have you got a drive? Have you got a garage? Where's your electricity supply? If you're in a flat, is your electricity supply five stories away from where you park your car? Um, so there are lots of challenges. Now, very interestingly, our, we've done research with millions of customers. And what we can tell you in the UK is 68% of people can access domestic overnight charging. 68% of drivers, okay? That's different to homeowners. Many, there is a correlation between homeowners that cannot access domestic overnight charging 
and those homeowners tend to not drive a car. Because if you take London, for example, there are a lower percentage of people that own their own private car, um, but then those people tend to have fewer parking spaces. So there are correlations there. So with drivers, it's 68% can access domestic overnight charging. And we need to touch on the range at this point with the customer. We need to encourage a test drive. So, Mr. Customer, you've decided you do not want to talk to me about electric vehicles. You're absolutely sick of hearing about them. That's okay. Not going to force it down your throat today, but why not take a ride out on an EV? Because next time, that's what you'll be driving. Okay. We then have to discuss PCP and HP options. Everybody will be discussing this in their sales process within dealerships already, because if you're not, you're missing a huge profit opportunity. It should be discussed before they arrive, when they arrive, and throughout the sales process, and then stacked as an offer every single time, as I'm sure you are all doing. You don't need me to go on about that. Then what we do is we take them through a cost comparison calculator. It's a simple system which just takes you through the combination of your payments, uh, your PCP payment, your HP payment, um, and also your um, fuel savings that are available to you, depending on what fuel you can access. And then ultimately an offer sheet, which pulls all of this in. So for those who've got systems and technology that's the latest stuff, you should be able to pull in um, all of this information into one place. Um, so you can present it in one screen really easily with auto lookups. Um, and then you've got your, uh, your EV and your ICE card that you present the office sheet for. So this, for me, is the foundations for the future for every single car dealership in the land. The days of selling petrol cars are going to come to an end. And we need to be discussing this and having conversation with customers all of the time. So let's talk about the new sales process. If you're not already doing this, we need this in every business because, you know, think about the number of car dealerships that are sat there having to register EVs because you're forced by your manufacturer because you're not retailing them. What's easier? Discussing EVs with every single customer and selling to one in five or registering a car and taking a 10 grand hit on it every three months? The answer is to retail your way out of these cars and avoid the write downs on your. Uh, on your demonstrators that you can't get rid of. Because if you discuss with every single customer EVs, you will sell between 20 and 30% of customers an EV today if you've got the range. So if you've got a three car EV range with your brand, um, I actually own a car business uh, as well as do Motivize, and 40% of our used car sales are electric vehicles. And that's because we have this conversation with every single customer. OK, so this is the old sales process. We've all seen sales process. Whatever words you use, it's not changed for generations. But at the top, meet and greet, understand or qualification. So we meet and greet the customer. We qualify the customer. We do our demonstration. We do our trial close and close or solutions. And then we do our handover. So the top bit is what we're all used to. We've all been doing it for a very long time. The bottom bit is the change that we need to implement to get EVs sold and retailed to consumers, not registered, and then us paying as dealers to write these things down. So what we need to do, when we meet and greet the customer, we need to touch on the ZEV mandate. We need to make sure customers know what it is and they understand they can buy an ICE car today, but they won't be able to do that next time they change. We then need to talk about EVs. We need to use the EV conversation pyramid and explain the options that are available to customers. So they have a full understanding of the range of powertrains and the benefits and disadvantages of the fuels of each of those different powertrains. We then need to encourage an EV test drive. So so many customers say, I don't want to talk about EVs. But do you know what? While I'm stacking the deal, while I'm valuing your car, let's go for a ride out in one. Go and drive it. Because invariably, when people get in an EV, they love it because it's so easy if they can get over the thought of it being automatic because that's a big blocker for so many consumers. And then what we do is we do a double stack. So we ensure we've stacked with the EV and we're stacked with the petrol car. And then at the handover, we've got a lot of work to do to help the consumer understand the difference and the different driving uh, ways of, of uh, interacting with an EV because it is a, it's something you have to get your head around. So, it's a new sales process. It's something that I believe we should be implementing in every single car dealership everywhere where we're looking to sell EVs. 
So back to the question. So we've been on a bit of a journey there. We've got all the mess. We've put it into a nice order. Um, is having the convenience of your own car and cost per mile more expensive? And let's talk about some real people. These are real deal, sh deal sheets, real offers that we've landed inside car dealerships recently. Um, this is Jim. Jim has a Hyundai i30, and he's looking at a new car. So Jim's details, he does 20,000 miles a year. His current car has no equity. That's refreshing, isn't it? How much negative equity do you see out there at the moment? It's everywhere. And what we are seeing is a reduction in conversion ratios for the events that we run in dealerships. We've seen a reduction in conversion ratios over the last 12 months of around a third. So you have to see more customers to do the same number of deals. Um, Car does 44 miles per gallon, he's paying 320 a month, which is not an unusual amount to be paying for a car. Like 68% of the UK public, Jim has a drive and could install a charger with access to domestic overnight charging. His maximum daily usage is 185 miles, so in any kind of two weeks or a month, it does 185. An in interesting statistic, most people never used public charging. So anybody that tells you, ooh, public charging infrastructure is not up to it, I don't think my mother's ever used it, and she's had an EV for three years, okay? Um, the average person uses it three times a year, depending on where you fit on that spectrum. If you're doing mega miles, traveling the whole length of the country uh, on a regular basis, you're going to use charging quite, public charging quite often. So Jim's offer, he's gonna, we're going to offer him a, a Kona EV, 160 kilowatt, um, 65 kilowatt hour battery, um, it will do 185 miles, so it meets his daily needs. Um, he has no equity, so he's putting his £500 deposit in. His new monthly payment on his PCP is an eye-watering £551 a month. And that's the kind of leap we're seeing in car dealerships all the time. The cost from where you were paying per month to what you are paying per month now is leaping. And, it, and it's very, very difficult to sell to a customer when you've got a, how much is that? A £231 a month increase. But that's what I see so often when I sit in car dealerships, closing deals, working with salespeople. That's a 73% increase in your monthly payment. So no wonder we've seen a reduction in showroom conversion ratios. So, I think it's fair to say new cars are much more expensive. You know, we are all seeing that, whether that's a monthly payment, whether that's the cash price for the vehicle, or even with the incentives that are on the table, you know, it's still a big leap for many consumers to go from their old new car to a, a new new car. But hold on, have we taken everything into account? Okay, this is a fuel price comparison calculator. I think it's the easiest one in the market. You can all access it free of charge. It's called compare.motivize.com. Um, I think it's simple because I built it. <laughs> so basically what we've got is on the left-hand side, you pick from a list of the vehicle. On the right-hand side, so the vehicle that he did have, so there's Jim's i30, um, and it's uh, all his derivative and things are on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, we've got the Hyundai Kona, the new car that he's buying. So we're comparing his Partex with his new car. Then what we do is we enter the mileage and what his cost for electricity is. So he's got domestic overnight charging, so he can get his 7.5 pence. And we know what fuel price is. Yesterday, the average fuel price in the UK was £1.36. So his fuel price he was paying last year on his i30, £2,760 a year. On his Kona, it'll cost him £400 per year. So that means that Jim could save £197 a month from driving the electric car rather than driving the petrol car. So that's compare.motivize.com. So let's add that in. So Jim's payments are £551. He saves £197 per month in fuel. They're real figures, his figures, personalized to him. His net monthly outgoings is £354 per month. Now, that is a more palatable £34 per month over what he was paying. Okay. So it suddenly makes the leap slightly more palatable. But this next one's actually the most interesting one of all and the thing that really got me thinking. Does everybody remember Reg Vardy? Uh, for me, Vardy is kind of royalty in the motor trade. And they, uh, they did things very, very well. Um, and um, you go back to the days that they had this big kind of philosophy in life. It was called making cars affordable. 
um, and they had miners driving around in Aston Martins because they managed to get finance. They really did lead the industry. They may have overcooked it in the end, but they were inspirational in terms of the way they led the industry back in the day. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to make cars affordable again for people. And this is how we're going to do it. And this is how we're going to change the industry and how we're going to make electric cars the right thing for most people. So this is Lizzie. I know Lizzie really well. Um, she owns a 2017 Range Rover Evoque. It's done 97,000 miles. She's had it since it was a couple of years old. She's looking at a used EV. She does 22,000 miles per year. She has an awful lot of running around to do after three different children at three different schools. And current car has a value of about 3,000 pounds. She doesn't know anything on it. She's not paying anything at the moment. And like 68% of the UK public, Lizzie drives, uh, has, has a drive and could install domestic overnight charging. Her maximum daily usage, she does a, a trip to the airport once a week, uh, uh, 215 miles when she has to go to the airport and back. So really important in thinking about what is the right vehicle for Lizzie. So she's decided on Jaguar I-Pace. Familiarity, Jaguar Land Rover, it feels a bit the same. So from the, from the Evoque that she was driving to the I-Pace. Um, now this, this is the fascinating thing. And this is what I was talking about earlier about RVs. This car is a 2020 I-Pace with 13,000 miles on the clock. There are so many three-year-old EVs with very low mileages on them out there in the market that you can buy. The car was for sale at 19,895. Okay, that's a 72,000 pound car new with 13,000 miles on the clock. It will do over 215 miles. It actually does about 260 miles when the sun is shining and it's not too cold. Um, so easily does her 215 miles to the airport and back. Um, Lizzie has a 3,000 pounds equity that she's going to put in. Um, and her new monthly payment on a Motonovo 48-month PCP works out at just £238 per month. That means her payments are affordable for her. It's not a massive jump over her Evoque. But hold on, that's not the entire story, is it? Okay. So let's look at this. There's the calculator again. What could she save on fuel? The Land Rover on the left, the Jaguar on the right. Compare electric to conventional costs. There's our petrol costs and our electricity cost. We qualified she can get domestic overnight charging. So she is saving £212 per month on, a, on fuel every single month. That means we can offset that against the PCP. So Lizzie was paying, sorry, her payment is 238 she saves £212 per month in fuel. She gets this car. She's gone from a 97,000-mile car to a 13,000-mile car, and it's costing her £26 per month. That's incredible. So this is when I have absolutely no doubt that EVs for 20 grand that do 250 miles at three years old with 13,000 miles on the clock aren't going to remain at 20 grand for long. Because when the motor industry catches on to the fact we can put people into much newer cars for very little money, this is going to be transformative. But we all have a job to do in the industry to lead people on this journey. Because it's not easy. It is complicated. Um, but I've given you two examples there, two different extremes of how cars are expensive and are also really cheap at the moment. And I really believe we can lead a crusade to make cars affordable again. But we've got so much to do to explain this to customers. So it's important we all change our sales process. We've got to facilitate accurate and helpful conversations with every single consumer that visits a car dealership. And this process, the standard process at the top that we've all used for many years, has to evolve and change and add all of these extra bits in at the bottom if we're going to help consumers save fortunes on cars. So are cars more expensive to have and drive? It depends on your perspective. Thank you. We're going to have a chat now. Over to you. Adam, so. <laughs> Adam uh, Spirit has been one of the, uh, the, the early adopters of this process and he uses it in his business on a daily basis. Um, how have you found that kind of on the journey, the cultural change to get your team to adopt this? So I think the big thing for us was um, 
the recognition and realization that we had to change to sell EVs. Uh, and we couldn't wait for the manufacturer to come up with a silver bullet. We couldn't wait for the government to come up with a silver bullet. And we couldn't wait you know, for charging infrastructure to come up with a silver bullet. Uh, because there is no silver bullet. Um, and what we realized is that we had to be fully accountable for our EV sales and our EV mix of sales, particularly as we knew where the manufacturers were heading with regard to future bonuses, et cetera, and where our income streams were going to come, be coming from and what the threats to that might be. So what we really focused on was creating a sort of a, a holistic approach to EVs. And a lot of that started with our culture. So making our teams embrace EVs as we moved forward with both our brands. And we have Hyundai and MG, so we're lucky because we've got really great EV product. We've got a whole plethora of product to offer our customers. But getting people to buy into that in your organization and getting them energized and positive about it, that's the challenge. So supported a bit by Fraser, we came up with a, uh, a concept of a business within a business, which was EV focused. And we, ca we gave that a bit of our name ourselves. Um, and from that, that put focus onto EVs. So we separated our sales team's minds from ICE to EV. So we gave them clarity to what they were going to be talking about when those customers came in. From there, it was about giving the team confidence in the product, confidence in the tech, uh, and how to communicate that within a sales process to the customers. From there, we went into how do you train a new sales process. The tech the guys can deal with, because a lot of the salespeople, they love tech, they love all the new stuff, and the manufacturers are good at providing that type of product knowledge training. The trick was how do you get them to adopt much softer skills within a sales process to be, have more empathy with the customers because as Fraser's highlighted, you can't use the traditional sales process where you rely on a sales team to race through to get to sign on the dotted line. If you do that with a potential EV buyer, you just send them straight out the door. I think uh, one of the other things that we've noticed in a lot of car dealerships is that salespeople don't like EVs. And the reason for that is they've no idea what it's like to wake up in the morning with a full car. Most salespeople don't have domestic overnight charging. They get in a car at the end of the day that's been used by every man and his dog. It's it's flat. The first trip is to a charger that's broken, um, and they're just not used to waking up in the morning and finding a, a full car that they never have to think about charging. You know, it's done for you while you're asleep. Um, and, and Adam kind of made some progress with that, didn't you, in terms of getting the whole team on board? Yeah, that was quite easy, really. I mean, it's. I think when you. When a lot of people here will have driven EVs. Um, and even our sales team had to get their head around it because, like everybody, they're inundated with media of the naysayers that say that EV is not going to happen, and it's, you know, it's never going to catch on, and the government's rubbish, and the manufacturers, are, it's, you know, it's all a mess, and somebody else needs to fix this problem, and that's simply not going to happen. So in the end, we figured out it's very simple. If you drive a petrol ice car, when you go home, on your way home, you don't go to a fuel station to make sure that it's full up. So when you get up in the morning, you see a full tank of fuel. You're quite happy to go home with 30 miles on the clock. And exactly the same concept applies to EVs. Now, if you have an EV and you go home at night, it's got 50 miles on, you wake up in the morning, it's still got 50 miles on. And your trip to work could be 20 miles. So. It shows, and what was really good and useful here is it showed that our salespeople learned about the anxiety that the customers were going to have. They therefore had empathy with the customer so they could talk about it as a conversation. I think one of the things we're also talking about is at the moment, your used car display probably has, I don't know, um, I don't know how many used cars you'll have that are EVs at the moment. Some garages it might be five, some garages it might be 10, might be 15. But at some point, almost every vehicle on your used car display and all of your demonstrators will all be EVs. You are going to have to install a pylon in the middle of your car park to charge them all, OK? It is never going to work. You are far better incentivizing your staff to put EV chargers in at home and paying them to fill the cars up at 7.5 pence a kilowatt overnight than you are trying to charge them all at home, in, uh, charge them all in the dealership at expensive charging rates you know, so disperse the cars at night, send them to places where they can be charged really cheaply. Um, don't try and build a massive infrastructure at your dealership to charge 
13 or 14 cars at a time. It just isn't going to work. There are so many things like this that we just aren't engaging with as an industry that other countries have already done. So car dealerships are going to need to incentivize their staff to install home chargers so that they have a good EV experience and they become advocates of EVs. And also, it's much cheaper for you to charge the cars in 10 different locations overnight than it is to install you know, a, a pylon in the middle of your car park so you can charge 10 EVs at a high speed. So there's so many things like this that we've got to adopt and change as we move forwards. I think the other thing as well that covering from your presentation is used cars. There's a huge amount of used car demand for EV powertrains. Um, and I think because of what happened with uh, Mr. Musk destroying the EV market by lowering all his prices uh, overnight, that costs a lot of the industry a lot of money, and it scared people off stocking EVs. Now, anyone that's any good at used cars knows if you don't stock cars, you don't sell cars. So as a result, the confidence in stocking EVs has fallen rapidly uh, during this year, and it's now starting to come back. So there's a lot of transactions on EVs going on for people that are confident to stock EVs that don't get the media attention because it's not new car stats, it's not SMMT, etc. So politicians don't jump on it, BBC don't jump on it, etc. What we're seeing is because of how all the algorithms work in a lot of the used car platforms, also Trader clearly being the main one, and as hi uh, Fraser highlighted, the stock profile of the average EV at the moment is very low mileage. And then when you look at the price, the price is very affordable. Now, that's not great for the RVs, and it's certainly not great for the, great for the lease companies who hold the lion's share of this stock. However, what it is doing is starting the green shoots in the market uh, for the used, used car buyer. So going back to Auto Trader, as you know, when you measure a used car and its attractiveness, you put in a, a low mileage um, EV, which is probably 15, 20,000 pounds less than it would have been 18 months, two years ago. And the desirability score on that car is 90 plus. Now, 90 plus means every used car site in the country should be wanting to buy that car. Now, as, and this is already starting to happen, and we're having a lot of success with it. Fraser clearly is, and I know a lot of other dealers are as well. As this feeds into the market and people recognize the demand, that will start lifting the residual values up because there's going to be more competition to buy those, those cars. Now, fairness is a bit bloody stupid to me saying this, isn't <laughs> it? Because it's going to hurt yeah. us. But I think what that means is I think we're seeing the green shoots of EV becoming a lot more prolific within the customers, and that will then feed into the new cars as well. Yeah, absolutely, because then your new car PCPs become affordable. I yeah. guess we're going to open it up to the floor. Yeah, do we have any questions from the floor for our uh, two experts? Um, if you would like to ask a question, just put your hand up and we'll bring the microphone to you. No need to be, sh no need to be shy. It only takes one and then we'll get a lot of questions. Or even challenge. If you, if you think what we've said, that's a load of nonsense, throw it back at me. I want to hear it. <laughs> Have a think. I do want to ask a question because the, 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 the sales process that you showed, Fraser, you could argue is a lot more complex than the sales process we currently have in terms of having to explain, qualify, uh, explain a whole new technology and a whole new process around using that technology. So, Adam, from your point of view, how is that changing the, the training that you have to give your sales staff? Is it changing the type of salesperson you're looking to employ? Um, to a degree, the, it definitely, the training is really important. You have to have really specific training around EV and how you deal with a customer that's potentially interested in EV or actually doesn't yet know they're interested in an EV because it does require a slightly different skill set, without a doubt. The other big thing around the training is with your managers, you have, to, you have to be very aware of your numbers and your conversions on your inquiries on EV powertrains versus your ICE powertrains. Because then when you're aware of the activity, you can really focus on it. You can start having lead tables, competitions, different commission schemes on powertrain, and so you naturally focus everybody in on it. That has quite a big effect. I think it's also about measuring it. Invariably with sales process, if you're not measuring your sales funnel, then it doesn't happen. And I, I, I don't know whether your sales people are any different to mine, but mine always wants to take the least line of resistance, and I have to constantly challenge and hold them to account, and ask them, are they selling to me, or are they selling to the customer? And actually having measurements on your sales funnel to ensure that how many people have come in on an ICE car had a conversation about an EV and end up buying an EV. And when you start measuring that, 
you can easily drive that to a 20% conversion ratio. So if you can imagine that one in five people that inquires on an ICE car drives away with an EV, well, we're already a long way towards next year, even the year after ZEV target, because it has a double effect on the ZEV target. So it takes somebody out of the market that would have been a petrol car driver and puts them into an EV. So it's a compound effect on the percentages. So, um, you know, that is the, the biggest opportunity in our industry is not to force more people down the fleet route and to discount cars down the fleet channel on EVs. The opportunity is in our showroom with retail customers. And we've proven, and Adam has proven, getting over that 20% retail EV mix is very doable. Yeah, I think it's all about confidence. Like most things in life, it's about confidence. And if your team are confident and energized about the concept of EV and confident talking to the customers, they will sell more. So you just got to give them the tools to do it. Okay, we have a question at the back. Yeah, I see you guys are going from ICE straight into EV. Okay. Where do you see middle ground, which is also becoming increasingly popular, i.e. hybrid and plug-in hybrid? You're, 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 you're very black and white. Where are we, what, are your, what are your opinions of that space in between? Okay, so there are certain manufacturers um, that have brought in hybrid vehicles very early. So let's take Toyota. Toyota had a very low CO2 emission baseline um, when the measurements were brought in, and they're going to suffer really badly with the government targets that we have at the moment. It seems very unfair. But ultimately, zero emission vehicle is a zero emission vehicle. For me, a hybrid is just another version of a petrol car, really. It throws out emissions. Yes, they might be better, but actually it's not a zero emission vehicle. Um, in terms of plug-in hybrid, a plug-in hybrid can be a zero emission vehicle most of the time for some consumers. Um, because ultimately they're running at all, they can run first 30, 50, 70 miles on zero emissions. So for me, I think there's a place for plug-in hybrids. Um, for anything that isn't that, I really do question whether it contributes towards the zero emissions that we're trying to achieve. Um, you know, yeah, you might think I'm a bit of a, a zealous EV enthusiast. I've lived with one. Like my car's seven years old now. Um, it's, a, it's a Tesla. It's done... Um, 85,000 miles, it is um, still at 98% of its battery. Um, yeah, it's not been the most reliable car, I'll be really honest with you. It's a Tesla. Um, the build quality. Help you with that. <laughs> yeah, but in terms of the battery and the things that everybody talks about, um, you know, the, the issues aren't anywhere near what people, certainly if you look at the right wing press. Um, it, you know, it's, they're very, very anti-EV. Mm. So how are you th seeing things, Adam? Because obviously Hyundai does have a range of, of power. Yeah, it does. And I think the point's very good. I think uh, in terms of the polarisation, and it sounds like we're just talking about ICE versus EV, but if when you look at the models that are out there and what's coming through, it's actually just going to be hybrid and EV because ICE engines are not going to be around for much longer. Hybrid ICE is going to be around and PHEV, but I think the traditional ICE, that won't be around for, for within the next couple of years. Um, so uh, I think then the interesting bit is on look at the price inflation on hybrid over ICE and ICE versus ICE over the last three or four years with everything that's gone on in the world. And then you're looking at the new change cycles that are people coming in. If you look at what the work that Fraser's done and you take the fact that that car ice to ice or hybrid to hybrid or hybrid to ice is going to be 150 pounds more a month than it was before. That's still a shock. If you then apply the EV, and EVs are getting closer to the PHEVs and, and, and hybrid engines, that price parity is coming. If you then apply the fuel savings, EV versus ice, the EV is probably going to be a better solution than hybrid to ice or PHEV to ice. Mm -hmm. A lot of people still see FEV as, uh, as, a, as a stepping stone, though, for those that are a bit nervous about going full steam into, into BEV. Are you, are you seeing that? Uh, yeah, PHEV hasn't, doesn't seem to have really taken off as we all thought it would, but I think that's some of the tech that's, that's hampered that. And when you look at some of the tech that's coming, like the, um, the new MG um, PHEV uh, has a 100-mile range just on the electric, yeah. plus then... 400 mile on the on on the ice on the on the on the hybrid. So, I think what that sort of tech is a bit of a game changer for PHEV. PHEV with just 30 miles EV, it's not that exciting. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
a final oh, question. Oh, now we've got all the questions are coming. Now we're 45 minutes up. Where were you five minutes ago? We've got one at the front and then one at the back. Okay. What's your thoughts oh. on uh, the commercial vehicle market? Say that again, sorry. What's your thoughts on the commercial vehicle market and when that might start to align with car? Okay, I mean, truthfully, I'm not... I'm one of those people that will tell you and I don't know what I'm talking about and I'm not particularly well versed on the commercial vehicle market other than I have a friend who services a fleet for Amazon and they are moving almost all of their vehicles over but their big restriction is they only have a very small time period in any part of the day in any one day where they can charge those vehicles and they all come back at one time into one location and they all have to be charged in a five or six hour period. And they're literally, again, back to pylons. They're literally having to install pylons into the, near the, where the, these vehicles are being charged because th there, there are challenges with that. There are other markets where they have battery exchanges going on. Not sure whether that's something that we need, but I guess it depends on what number of hours in any 24 hour period it's on the road and what the window of opportunity for charging is. So, you know, it's not my specialist area, if I'm absolutely honest. I think the only thing I, I, mean, I don't sell of commercials, but the only thing I do know from my work with Hyundai is on the large uh, commercial vehicles, hydrogen really does seem to be the future on the large commercials. There are a lot of challenges. I can talk to you about them afterwards, if you like, because I do, uh, part of the business is, is fleet news as well, so we do quite a lot in the, uh, in the van market. So, but there was a question at the back. Okay, final question, I think, before we wrap up. Oh, yes, um, really, um, I'm part of Women Drive EV group. Um, we're quite uh, visible on social media, etc. No, obviously, I also work in the automotive industry. One of the biggest challenges is consumer awareness, exactly what you're talking about. It's great that you're, you're telling us today, but on dealers' websites, on, on social media itself, it's still so confusing for them on what and how and should they buy an EV. Now, I would never go back to ICE, absolutely never in a million years. I, I love, love EV. But I think this is an industry we need to do better um, I push a lot of people to electrifying.com, to Ginny Buckley. Yeah, yeah um, Ginny's website's fantastic. Yeah, and she's, she's a friend as well. But um, I think we could do more on our own dealer websites, making it far, far more easier for them to understand and what actually would work for them. Yeah. yeah because the myth, oh, I haven't got a charger at home, I can't have one. It, yes, it's, it's harder. It's definitely not impossible. So, yeah. Adam, are you doing anything on your website to support your sales story? Yeah, we are. We, we, we have uh, uh, sections dedicated to EV and, 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 and trying to give customers confidence, mainly to say that we know what we're talking about. So if they are interested in EV, we're a known credible source and not everyone's doing that. I think that's the first stage. Um, of course, because we're franchised, we're also sort of slightly curtailed by what the manufacturers will and won't let us do. And you've got to dot all the I's and cross all the T's. So you're right, there's blockages that definitely need to be freed up. And interestingly, we did some research recently. Uh, we surveyed an entire network for one brand. We, we surveyed their customers. We asked the customers, last time you were in a car dealership, were EVs discussed with you? Only one in 10 customers had had a discussion about an EV when they're in the car dealership. The only way you'll get change and you'll get people to adopt change is to handhold them and to talk them through it and explain how simple it is and to debunk a lot of the myths that are propagated by two right-wing newspapers. Um, and, and the only way you're going to do that is to, is to make sure every customer, when they come in for a car, has a discussion. We have an obligation to do that. Uh, and also, a huge profit opportunity. So instead of registering cars and writing them down, registering EVs and writing them down, we'll be retailing them. And those dealers that are doing that already, like Adams, aren't writing down EVs. They're just retailing straight out of them. So the opportunity is not only an opportunity to educate, but it's an opportunity to reduce costs as a dealer. So it's a win-win situation. So I'm completely on board with what you say. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you for your questions. Please join me in thanking our experts for their insights and, and knowledge, uh, Fraser Brown and Adam Derbyshire, and enjoy the rest of Automotive Management Live. Thank you, thank you guys.